the University of Ottawa, who joins us now. Uh, we're at the hands of technology at times, and you're in the middle of something, and I know you do podcasting, and then boom, something <laughs> gives. And uh, I think the worst is when you don't realize that you're not on. It happens to me all the time. I was talking, yeah. and suddenly <laughs> I'm not broadcasting. Yeah. So we appreciate your patience during pandemic times. We will uh, try to get that fixed over the weekend for Monday. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the issues that they've had in Europe sent some shockwaves here. Uh, we've had lots of communication from people that are concerned about this, and we should set this straight once and for all. This is a very different situation when it comes to Canada, is it not? It is. So let's back up for a second. The issue is that some cases of blood clotting was discovered in recipients of the uh, of the vaccine. But just because you got a blood clot and you got the vaccine doesn't mean the vaccine caused the blood clot. The way we assess this is, first of all, we look at the the incidence of blood clotting in the general population and ask ourselves, is it less or more than in the vaccinated population? After assessing it, they concluded that it's actually equivalent. So it's unlikely that the vaccine is associated with this at all. Even if it was, even if it was, we're looking at about 30 cases, I think, out of 5 million vaccinations in Europe, which is a risk of 0.0006%, which is vanishingly small. It's lightning strike. So the message to people about this would be? It's not anything to worry about. <laughs> and also, the, the AstraZeneca doses we get in Canada are from India. They're not from Europe. So this is, if it's anything, if it's anything, it's a problem with the batch, not with the vaccine, but the batch of this particular vaccine, which is in Europe, not in Canada. Okay, so that's, that's off the table. And I, I think we can explain that to, to people and they can nod their head and say, yes, I get that in my brain. Um, it's maybe tougher in the heart when they're coming with you at the needle. So how do we wrap our mind around any of this really? And, and I guess that's where the hesitancy comes in. Yeah. So first of all, we have to be transparent and say that everything comes with risk. Even the vaccines that are really ultra safe come with some risk. Again, 0.0006% risk, which is small. The risk of getting COVID and getting something bad is high. Guess what causes blood clots? COVID causes blood clots. The vaccines don't. So how do I put this? Uh, every time you step outside your door, you take a risk. When you drive your car, you take a risk. You know, when you drink something you didn't make uh, and you eat food that was not made by you, there's a risk associated with it. The risk of a vaccine is actually much smaller than any of those things. And that's a difficult thing to understand when you're injecting your body with a foreign substance. But we do this every day. It's just that this time it's in the news all the time. Right. And I, I think what people also need to understand is people are going to have blood clots and heart attacks and get the the flu or um, other things will happen. And it may be the around the time of a vaccine, but they maybe would have happened if they didn't get a needle. So as you're saying, that causation doesn't necessarily mean correlation. That's right. Also, keep in mind, we're looking at an elderly population for the most part when we're examining these vaccines. Uh, there's so much concern about is AstraZeneca good for an older population. Old people have a lot of things going wrong with them, right? So they're more likely to die, more likely to have all kinds of morbidities. That doesn't mean it's caused by the vaccine. So we have to separate causation from correlation. It's the age-old mantra. With Raywat Dionand, and even as we have relaxed somewhat here in Manitoba, our case numbers are slowly going back up again. What is that telling you? It's telling me that that third wave is a possibility, a strong possibility, and the new variants are real. Now, I don't know if the new variants are prevalent in Manitoba. They're probably not as bad as, say, in Ontario. No, they're not. Yeah. We've 23. had one, 23 so far. Yeah. Right. So that's not what's driving this. It's the, the COVID classic is transmissible enough, you know, and it doesn't take a whole lot to uh, get a foothold. But um, the end is near. We're in the third act of this movie. It's just that we have a couple more months to, to persevere and not to take our foot off the brake. And uh, vaccination is our best solution out of this. So my encouraging words are, if a vaccine is offered to you, if it's the AstraZeneca or Janssen shots, you take it. That's the best choice you can make for your health on that day. And the more people that get vaccinated, the faster this thing goes away. Rewa, what do you think of vaccine passports? The whole idea that if you've had the vaccine, uh, you have proof of that and you can get into a sporting event or a concert or travel internationally. It's the great debate uh, right yeah. now across this country. 
What do you think about them? So it already exists internationally for travel. Uh, many countries won't let you in unless you have proof of like uh, yellow fever vaccination. So this is a, a well-known thing already. Domestically, it's a little harder. So internationally, you can imagine a situation where there's a QR code on your phone and that goes to a government website that that validates your vaccination status. It's harder to do domestically when it's linked to you know local public health and it can be uh, forged quite easily. So I'm in favor of this internationally. It solves a lot of problems and nobody has to travel. It's just that if you choose to travel, you just put up with this nonsense. But domestically, it's harder to apply. Uh, and I would rather see us drive transmission rates really low and open things up for everyone rather than open things up for a segment of the population causing a new kind of classism. Manitoba's top doctor um, easing restrictions further again as of midnight, saying if you're at a religious service and you're sitting with your family members, you can take the mask off unless you're singing and as long as you're physically distanced from others. And uh, plot twist, this is a big one here, um, you can go and sit with people from not your household on a patio outside, up to six of you. Uh, are those sound decisions from where you sit? The meeting with people not in your household sounds a little problematic to me if you're not wearing a mask and you're facing each other and you're talking. Uh, even outside? Even outside. If if you're looking away, okay. you know, if you're looking around, okay, but if you're directing your speech at each other for... The, the formula here is intensity of exposure multiplied by duration. If it's for a few minutes, fine. If you're sitting there for several hours, the probability of something happening goes up. So if you're limiting the duration of this, then I'm happier with it. It's not ideal. Mind you, I am sensitive to the fact that we have to manage people's mental health and need to socialize. If, if they're going to socialize, let's do the harm reduction approach and give them strategies to minimize risks. So in that sense, it's okay. It's not ideal, but it's okay. He's talking on the radio. He posts it religiously when he's done. And you can see the video of our conversation on <laughs> you, Ray Watt, yes, Ian Evans' <laughs> Twitter. Uh, he is a house epidemiologist for us here at CJOB. We always appreciate his time. He's from the University of Ottawa. Thank you. In a